golden goose. There once was a man who lived at the edge of a forest. He had three sons. One day, the eldest boy went to cut wood. His mother gave him a cake and some fresh milk to take. After a short time, a little old man with a gray beard approached him. Would you please give me something to eat and drink? The man asked. I am very hungry and thirsty. But the boy refused. I won't have enough for myself if I share it with you, he said, and he continued cutting wood. A short while later, the axe slipped and cut the boy's arm. He went home to have it bandaged. The second son said that he would go to cut wood instead. His mother gave him a cake and some fresh milk. Once again, the old man approached and asked for a share. No, the boy said, because whatever I give to you, I can't have myself. Soon after, his axe also slipped and cut his leg. He limped home to have his leg bandaged. The youngest boy, Billy, then said that he would go to cut wood. His father refused. You are a silly boy. Your brothers have hurt themselves, so you certainly will too, he said. But Billy insisted. At last, his mother gave him a dry biscuit and a bottle of plain water, and he set off into the forest. No sooner had he started work than the old man appeared and asked for a drink and a bite to eat. It's plain food, Billy said, but if you're happy with the dry biscuit and water, I'll gladly share with you. They shared the biscuit and water. Then the little old man said, You have been good to me, and you will have your reward. Cut down that tree over there and see what you find inside it. Billy did as the man said. Hidden inside the tree trunk, he found a goose with shining feathers of pure gold. Billy wondered how there could be such a strange bird. He looked around for the old man, but he had vanished. So Billy picked up the goose and set off for home. Before long, Billy was totally lost. It was growing dark, so when he came to an inn, he decided to stay the night. The innkeeper had three daughters. They were very curious about the golden goose. When Billy went for supper, the eldest girl thought she would steal a single feather. As soon as she put her hand on the goose, she stuck fast to it. No matter how she struggled, she couldn't get free. The middle girl, also wanting a feather, tried to push her sister out of the way, but found that she became stuck fast to her sister's arm. When the youngest girl approached, her sisters warned her not to touch them, but she thought they were trying to keep the golden feathers all for themselves. She took hold of the middle sister's arm, and immediately she stuck like glue. The next morning, Billy set off down the street with the golden goose dragging the girls behind him. As they passed the church, the parson called out, What are you girls doing running after that young man? Let go at once! He tried to pull the youngest girl away, but he was then as stuck as they were. The parson called to his wife to free him, but that just ended with the wife sticking to the parson. Two farmers ran from their fields to help the strange group, and soon they were stuck fast too. By now there were seven people in line following behind the boy with his golden goose. It was the strangest procession you could imagine. It happened that they passed near the king's palace. He had a daughter, but she was always miserable. No one could make the princess smile, let alone laugh. The king was so desperate to cheer her up that he had promised her hand in marriage to anyone who could make her happy. Many young men had tried to amuse her, 
telling jokes, doing tricks, fooling around, and making faces, but nothing worked. She was as sad as ever. When the princess looked out of her window that day and saw Billy walking along the street carrying a golden goose, she started to smile. Then she saw the three sisters, the parson, the parson's wife, and the two farmers staggering along behind. Her smile turned to a laugh, and her laugh became louder and louder. She laughed so hard that tears ran down her cheeks. My dear, what has made you laugh? The king cried, delighted. The princess was laughing so much she couldn't speak. She could only point at Billy, and the long line of people stuck to the goose. The king sent a footman to bring Billy to the palace. The princess is laughing, the king exclaimed. You made her laugh. That means you may marry her. I? Marry the princess? Billy said. Why, yes, the king answered. I am so glad that at last someone has helped my poor, sad daughter. All I want is for her to be happy. If you can make her smile and laugh, you are the best husband she could have. Suddenly, the golden goose jumped from Billy's arms, and all the people toppled backward, unstuck. Billy and the princess soon married, and they lived long, happy lives, full of smiles and laughter. The End Hansel and Gretel Once upon a time, there were two children named Hansel and Gretel. They lived in a small cottage at the edge of the forest with their father and stepmother. Hansel and Gretel's father was a woodcutter. He was very poor, and the family didn't have much food to eat. The day came when there was hardly any food left at all. What are we to do? cried the father. The stepmother, who didn't like Hansel and Gretel, said, We must take the children into the thickest part of the forest and leave them there. There are just too many mouths to feed. We can't do that, protested the father, for he loved his children dearly. We must or we'll all die of hunger, screeched his wife. The children are going and that is that. From their bedroom, Hansel and Gretel overheard the conversation. Gretel burst into tears. Don't worry, Hansel said. I'll look after you. When their parents went to bed, Hansel crept out of the house. All around lay little white pebbles that shone like coins in the silvery moonlight. He filled his pockets with them and then went back to bed. Early the next morning, the stepmother hurried Hansel and Gretel out of bed. Come on, children, we're going into the forest to chop wood, she told them. With a heavy heart, the woodcutter led his children into the forest. As they walked along, Hansel dropped the pebbles from his pockets onto the path. When they reached the middle of the forest, the woodcutter said, Wait here, we'll be back as soon as we finish chopping wood. Hansel and Gretel waited all day, but their father and stepmother didn't come back. Soon it was dark among the thick trees. Gretel was frightened. We'll find our way home, Hansel comforted his sister. When the moon rose high in the sky, the white pebbles that Hansel had left on the path lit up. He grabbed his sister's hand. Come on, Gretel, the pebbles will show us the way home. When Hansel and Gretel returned, the woodcutter was relieved to see his children again, but their stepmother was furious. Before long, the woodcutter and his family had very little food again. Tomorrow we will take the children deeper into the forest. They must not find their way home, the stepmother cried. This time, as they were led deep into the forest, Hansel left a trail of breadcrumbs. When their parents didn't return from chopping wood, Hansel said, We'll follow the breadcrumbs I dropped on the path. They will lead us home. But when the moon came up, Hansel and Gretel couldn't see any crumbs. The birds must have eaten them all, whispered Hansel. Frightened and hungry, Hansel and Gretel curled up under a tree and went to sleep, 
waiting anxiously for daylight. The next morning they wandered through the forest, and after a while they came to a clearing and a little cottage. Hansel, look, cried Gretel, that cottage is made out of sweets and gingerbread. The children were so hungry, they grabbed some sweets from the walls of the house. Just then, the door opened and an old woman hobbled out. Come in, children, she said, smiling. I've got plenty more food in here. Their stomachs growling, Hansel and Gretel followed the old woman into the cottage. After a delicious meal, she showed them two little beds, and they lay down to sleep. The children didn't know that the old woman was actually a wicked old witch who liked to eat children. When Hansel and Gretel woke up from their nap, the witch grabbed Hansel and locked him in a cage. She set Gretel to work cleaning and cooking huge meals to fatten up Hansel. Weeks passed. Every morning the witch went up to the cage. Hold out your finger, boy. I want to feel if you are fat enough to eat. Hansel, being a smart boy, would hold out an old chicken bone instead. The witch's eyesight was so bad that she thought the bone was Hansel's finger. She wondered why the boy wasn't getting any fatter. One day the witch grew impatient. I can't wait any longer, she screeched. I'm going to cook Hansel now. Gretel was terrified. We'll bake some bread to eat with your brother, said the witch. Go and check if the oven is hot enough. Grabbing Gretel's arm, the wicked witch pushed her roughly toward the open oven door. Grinning horribly, she licked her cracked lips. She was planning on eating Gretel too and couldn't wait for her delicious meal. Gretel guessed the witch's trick. I'm too big to fit in there, she said. Oh, you silly girl, cackled the witch. Even I can fit in there. And she put her head into the oven to prove she was right. Gretel gave her a giant push, and the witch fell right inside. Gretel quickly slammed the oven door shut. Hansel, the witch is dead, cried Gretel as she unlocked her brother's cage. As Hansel and Gretel made their way out of the house, they discovered that it was full of sparkling jewels and gold coins. The children stuffed their pockets with treasure. Come on, Gretel, laughed Hansel. Let's go home. Their father was overjoyed to see them. He told them that their stepmother had died while they were gone, and they had nothing to fear any more. Hansel and Gretel showed their father the jewels and coins. They would be poor no longer. And from then on, the woodcutter and his children were never hungry again. The End The Frog Prince There once was a princess with a smile more dazzling than the sun. She lived with her father, the king, in a palace surrounded by thick woods. When the weather was very hot, the princess would walk into the shade of the forest and sit by a pond. There she would take out her favorite toy, a golden ball that her father had given her. Over and over she would throw it up into the air and catch it again. One day the ball slipped from her hand and fell into the pond with a splash. The pond was so deep that she couldn't see the bottom. My beautiful golden ball, sobbed the princess. She cried as if her heart would break. Her tears drip dropping into the water. The princess thought her favorite toy was lost forever. An ugly speckled frog popped his head out of the water. Why are you crying? He asked. I have dropped my precious golden ball into the water, she cried. What will you give me if I fetch it back for you? asked the frog. You may have my jewels and pearls, even the crown on my head, sobbed the unhappy princess. I don't need any of those things, said the frog. If you promise to care for me and be my friend, let me share food from your plate and sleep on your pillow, 
then I will bring back your golden ball. I promise, said the princess, but she didn't really mean it. As the frog swam down into the murky water, she thought, he's only a silly old frog. I won't have to do any of those things. When the frog swam back up with the ball, she snatched it from him and ran all the way back to the palace. That evening, the princess was having dinner with her family when there was a knock on the door. Princess, let me in, called a croaky voice. When the princess went to open the door, she was horrified to find the speckled frog sitting in a puddle of water. She slammed the door and hurried back to the table. Why do you look so frightened? asked the king. Was it a witch? No, father, it was a frog, replied the princess. What does a frog want with you? asked the puzzled king. The princess told her father all about losing the ball and the promise she had made to the frog. Princesses always keep their promises, my dear, insisted the king. Let the frog in and make him welcome. The princess did as she was told. As soon as the frog hopped through the door, he asked to be lifted up onto the princess's plate so that he could share her food. When the frog saw the look of disgust on the princess's face, he sang, Princess, princess, fair and sweet, you made a special vow to be my friend and share your food, so don't forget it now. The king was annoyed to see his daughter acting so rudely. This frog helped you when you were in trouble, he said. You made him a promise, and now you must keep it. The princess had no choice. She lifted the damp frog onto her plate and watched as he nibbled at her food. For the rest of the evening, the frog followed the princess everywhere she went. She hoped that he would go back to his pond when it was time for bed, but he did not. When darkness fell, the frog yawned and stretched. I am tired. He said, take me to your room and let me sleep on your silken pillow. The princess was horrified. No, I won't, she said. Go back to your pond, you slimy creature, and leave me alone. The patient frog sang. Princess, princess, fair and sweet, you made a special vow to be my friend and share your food, so don't forget it now. The princess had no choice but to take him to her room. She couldn't bear the thought of sleeping next to him, though, so instead of placing him on her pillow, she put him in a corner on the floor. Then she climbed into her bed, laid her head down on the silken pillow, and went to sleep. After a while, the frog jumped up onto the bed. It's drafty on the floor. Let me sleep on your pillow as you promised, he said. The sleepy princess felt more annoyed than ever. She picked up the frog and hurled him across the room, where he landed with a smack on the floor. The frog lay there, dazed and helpless. The princess shook herself properly awake and saw the frog lying still. She was suddenly filled with pity. She couldn't bear the thought that she might have hurt the poor thing. Oh, you poor darling, she cried, and she picked him up and kissed him. The frog transformed into a handsome young prince. Sweet princess, he cried, I was bewitched, and your tender kiss has broken the curse. The prince and princess soon fell in love and were married. They often walked in the shady forest together and sat by the pond, tossing the golden ball back and forth and smiling at how they first met. The End Jack and the Beanstalk Once upon a time, there was a young boy named Jack who lived with his mother in a cottage. They were so poor that, bit by bit, 
They had to sell everything they owned just to buy their food. Then, one day, Jack's mother said to him, We will have to sell Bluebell, our old cow. Take her out to the market, Jack, and remember to sell her for a good price. So Jack took Bluebell off to market. He had just reached the edge of the town when an old man appeared at the side of the road. Are you going to sell that fine cow? said the man. Yes, said Jack. Well, I'll buy her from you and I'll give you these magic beans, said the man, holding out a handful of dry beans. They don't look like much, but if you plant them, you and your mother will be rich beyond your wildest dreams. Jack liked the sound of being rich, and he didn't even stop to wonder how this stranger knew about his mother. It's a deal, he said. He gave Bluebell to the man and took the beans. When Jack showed his mother the beans, she was so angry that her face turned as red as a beetroot. You stupid boy! Go to your room! She cried and threw the beans out of the window. Jack sat on his bed, feeling miserable. Stupid beans, he muttered. Stupid me. Then he fell asleep. When Jack woke up the next morning, it was strangely dark in his room, and all he could see through the window were the leaves of a huge plant, a plant so tall that he couldn't see the top of it. It must be a magic beanstalk, cried Jack. What's at the top? So Jack started to climb. Up he went, from branch to branch and from leaf to leaf. At the top was a giant house. Jack's tummy was rumbling with hunger, so he knocked on the great big door. A giant woman answered. Please, madam, may I have some breakfast? Jack asked politely. You'll become breakfast if my husband finds you, said the giant's wife. But Jack begged and pleaded, and the last she led him in and gave him some bread and milk. The giant's wife had just shown Jack where to hide when the giant came home in a bad mood. Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, roared the giant. Silly man said his wife. You smell the sausages I have cooked for your breakfast. The giant ate a giant-sized breakfast, then settled down to count the huge gold coins in his treasure chest. There were lots of coins. One hundred and one. One hundred and two, he counted, but his head started to nod, and before long he was fast asleep. Quick as a flash, Jack grabbed two of the huge gold coins and ran out through the front door. He raced to the beanstalk and climbed down it as fast as his legs would carry him. His mother was so happy to see the gold that she hugged Jack for ten whole minutes. Clever boy, Jack, she laughed. We'll never be poor again. Before long, however, Jack and his mother had spent all the money, so the boy decided to climb the beanstalk again. Just as before, Jack knocked on the door and asked the giant's wife for some food. He begged and he pleaded, and at last she let him in. She gave him some bread and milk and hid him in the cupboard just as the giant arrived home. When the giant had eaten a giant-sized lunch, his wife brought him his pet hen. Lay, he bellowed, and the hen laid a solid gold egg. It laid ten eggs before the giant started to snore. Jack could hardly believe his luck. Quick as a flash, he picked up the hen and ran. When his mother saw the hen lay a golden egg, she hugged Jack for twenty whole minutes. Although Jack and his mother were now rich beyond their wildest dreams, the boy couldn't help himself. He decided to climb the beanstalk one more time. 
This time, Jack knew that the giant's wife would not be happy to see him, so he sneaked in when she wasn't looking and quickly hid in the cupboard. The giant came home as usual and ate a giant-sized dinner. Then his wife brought him his magic harp. Play! he roared, and the harp began to play. It was such sweet music that the giant fell asleep in record time. Jack grabbed the harp and started to run, but the harp cried out, Master, help! The giant woke up at once and chased after Jack. The boy slithered down the beanstalk faster than he'd ever done before, but the giant was catching up. Mother, fetch me the axe! Jack yelled as he reached the ground. Then he chopped at the beanstalk with all his might. Creak, groan. The giant quickly climbed back up to the top just before the beanstalk crashed to the ground. When his mother heard the harp play, she hugged Jack for a whole hour. And as you can imagine, the two of them lived happily ever after. The End Cinderella Once upon a time, there was a young girl who lived with her widowed father. Eventually, her father remarried. His new wife had two daughters of her own. She was mean and spiteful to the young girl, and so were her daughters. They made the girl do all the housework, eat scraps, and sleep by the fireplace among the cinders and ashes. Because she slept in the cinders, they named her Cinderella. One day, a letter arrived from the palace. All the women in the land were invited to attend a grand ball, where the prince would choose a bride. Cinderella's stepsisters were very excited. Her stepmother was sure one of her daughters would marry the prince. She made Cinderella work night and day to make them as beautiful as possible. Cinderella washed and curled their dull hair. She cut and shaped their ragged nails. She stitched their ball gowns, and she polished their dancing shoes until they shone. Cinderella longed to go to the ball herself, but her stepsisters just laughed. You go to a ball? The elder stepsister said. But you don't have a pretty dress. How ridiculous, laughed the young stepsister. You are always covered with soot and cinders. Tears ran down Cinderella's face as she helped her stepsisters into their dresses and jewels. At last, they left for the ball. Cinderella sat alone by the fireplace. She cried and cried. If only I could go to the ball, she said through her tears, and be happy for just one night. I so wish I could go. Cinderella had barely finished speaking when there was a sparkle of light in the dull kitchen, and there stood a fairy. Don't be afraid, my dear. I am your fairy godmother, the fairy said, and you shall go to the ball. Cinderella stared in amazement at the fairy. Quickly, she dried her eyes. Really? Can I really go to the ball? She asked, barely daring to believe it. If you do as I say, all will be well, the fairy answered. I'm used to doing as I'm told, Cinderella sniffed. The fairy godmother told her to bring a pumpkin, four white mice, and a black rat. Cinderella hurried to the garden to pick a pumpkin. She found four mice in the kitchen, and she caught a rat sleeping in the barn. With a wave of the fairy's wand, the pumpkin turned into a gleaming golden coach. Cinderella gasped in astonishment. It's beautiful, she said, but who will drive it? The fairy waved her wand again, and the four mice became four handsome white horses. She waved her wand a third time, and the rat turned into a tall coachman. How wonderful, Cinderella cried, but I can't go to the ball in these rags. And you won't go in rags, her fairy godmother cried. She waved her wand, 
and Cinderella's rags turned into a beautiful ball gown. Glittering glass slippers appeared on her feet. Cinderella looked lovely. Now off you go, her fairy godmother said, but remember, all this will vanish at midnight, so make sure you are home by then. Cinderella climbed into the coach and it whisked her away to the palace. She had never been happier. Everyone was enchanted by the lovely stranger, especially the prince, who danced with her all evening. Cinderella enjoyed herself so much that she completely forgot her fairy godmother's warning. Suddenly, the palace clock began to strike midnight. Bong! 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 Cinderella picked up her skirt and fled. The worried prince ran after her. Bong! 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 She ran down the palace steps. She lost one of her glass slippers on the way, but she didn't dare stop. Bong! 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 Cinderella jumped into the coach, and it drove off before the prince could stop her. Bong! 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 On the final stroke of midnight, Cinderella found herself sitting on the road beside a pumpkin. Four white mice and a black rat scampered around her. She was dressed in rags and had only a single glass slipper left from her magical evening. Even if it was a dream, she said to herself, it was a perfect dream. At the palace, the prince looked longingly at the glass slipper he had found on the steps. He could not forget the wonderful girl he had danced with all night. I will find her, he said to himself, and I will marry her. So he took the glass slipper and set out to visit every house in the land. At last he came to Cinderella's house. Her two stepsisters tried and tried to squeeze their huge feet into the delicate slipper, but no matter what they did, they could not get the slipper to fit. Cinderella watched as she scrubbed the floor. May I try, please? she asked. You? laughed the eldest. You didn't even go to the ball. Everyone may try, the prince said. Cinderella sat down. Her foot slipped easily into the glass slipper. The prince took Cinderella in his arms. You are the one, he said. Will you marry me, please? Cinderella's stepmother and stepsisters were furious. It can't be her. She's just the servant. She dresses in rags. But at that moment, the fairy godmother appeared and turned Cinderella's rags back into the fabulous ball, ball gown. Cinderella took the other slipper from her pocket. Yes, Cinderella said. Yes, it was me. And yes, I will marry you. Much to the disgust of her stepmother and stepsisters, Cinderella married the prince the very next day and went to live in the palace. The couple lived long, happy lives together, and Cinderella's stepmother and her daughters had to do their own cleaning and never went to another ball at the palace. The End Rapunzel Once upon a time, a young couple lived in a cottage beside a stone wall. They were very poor, but very happy, as the woman was expecting a baby. On the other side of the wall lived an old witch. The witch grew many herbs and vegetables in her garden, but she kept them all for herself. One day the couple had only a few potatoes to eat for their supper. They thought of the wonderful vegetable patch on the other side of the wall. It was full of delicious looking carrots, cabbages, and tomatoes. Surely it wouldn't matter if we took just a few vegetables said the wife, gazing longingly over the wall. We could make such good soup, agreed her husband. So the young man quickly climbed over the wall 
and started to fill his basket with vegetables. Suddenly, he heard an angry voice. How dare you steal my vegetables? It was the witch. Please, don't hurt me, begged the young man. My wife is going to have a baby soon. You may keep the vegetables and your life, she croaked, but you must give me the baby when it is born. Terrified, the man had to agree. Months later, the woman gave birth to a little girl. Immediately, the witch arrived and grabbed the child. Though the parents begged and cried, the cruel witch took the baby. She named her Rapunzel. Years passed, and Rapunzel grew up to be kind and beautiful. The witch was so afraid of losing her that she built a tall tower with no door and only one window. She planted thorn bushes all around it. Then she locked Rapunzel in the tower and never let her see anyone else. Each day, Rapunzel brushed and combed her long golden locks. And each day, the witch came to visit her, standing at the foot of the tower and calling out, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. Rapunzel hung her hair out of the window and the witch climbed up it to sit and talk with her. But Rapunzel was very lonely. She longed to leave the tower and make friends her own age. Each day she sat at her window and sang sadly. One day a young prince rode by and heard beautiful singing coming from the witch's garden. He hid behind a thorn bush, hoping to see the singer, but instead he saw the witch. He watched as she stood below the tower and called, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. The prince saw the cascade of golden hair fall from the window, and he watched the witch climb up it. He waited until the witch climbed back down the hair and returned to her house. Rapunzel began her song again. Enchanted by Rapunzel's lovely voice, the prince climbed over the wall and crept to the tower. Rapunzel! Rapunzel! Let down your hair! He called softly. Rapunzel let down her locks and the prince climbed up it. Poor Rapunzel was terribly afraid. She had never seen anyone except the witch before. When the prince explained that he only wanted to be her friend, Rapunzel was delighted. From then on, the prince came to visit her every day. Each time, he carefully waited until after the witch's visit before calling to Rapunzel to let down her hair. Months passed, and Rapunzel and the prince fell in love. How can we be together? Rapunzel cried. The witch will never let me go. The prince had an idea. He brought silk which Rapunzel knotted together to make a ladder so that she could escape from the tower. One day, without thinking, Rapunzel remarked to the witch, It's much harder to pull you up than the prince. The witch was furious. Prince? she shouted. What prince? The witch grabbed Rapunzel's long hair and cut it off. Then she used her magic to send Rapunzel far into the forest. The girl made her home among the animals and birds and sang sadly as she collected fruit and berries to eat. Soon the prince came to the tower and called, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. The witch held the golden hair out the window and the prince climbed up and up and into the tower. But instead of Rapunzel, he came face to face with the ugly old witch. You! screamed the witch. You dare to visit Rapunzel? You will never see her again! And she pushed the prince back out of the window. He fell down and down right into the thorn bushes below. The sharp spikes scratched the prince's eyes and blinded him. Weeping, he stumbled away. After months of wandering, blind and lost, the prince heard beautiful, 
sad singing floating through the woods. He recognized Rapunzel's voice immediately and called out to her. Rapunzel ran to the prince and held him in her arms. At last I have found you, she said and cried with happiness. As her tears fell onto his hurt eyes, the wounds healed and the prince could see again. My love, he said and kissed Rapunzel. Rapunzel had never been so happy. She and the prince were soon married, and Rapunzel's parents came to the wedding. Rapunzel and the prince lived happily ever after in a grand castle, far away from the old witch and her empty tower. The End The Flying Trunk Once there was a merchant, so rich, he could have paved a street with silver, but instead he chose to leave all his money to his idle son. After enjoying the high life, the son soon found that all his father's money had vanished. His friends disappeared too, but one sent him an old trunk with a note saying, Pack up and be off. The merchant's son was amazed to discover that the trunk could fly. So he climbed in, closed the lid, and flew high into the sky, leaving his troubles behind. At last the trunk descended and he found himself in a foreign land. Hiding the trunk in a forest, he walked into the town. Who lives in that palace? he asked the stranger, pointing up to the hill. The king's daughter, came the reply. It has been prophesied that a man will make her unhappy, so no one is allowed to visit, except the king and the queen. Hearing this, the merchant's son had an idea. That evening, he flew up to the palace roof and into the princess's room. He was immediately struck by her beauty. Do not be afraid, he told her gently. I am a prophet descended from the sky. The lonely princess was excited to have company. She was entranced by the stranger's tale of mermaids in the dark blue seas and princesses on magical snow-clad mountains. She believed this prophet had been sent just for her and readily agreed to his proposal. But first, you must come here on Saturday, she told him. The king and queen will be pleased to hear I am to marry a prophet and then she gave him some advice. They are exceedingly fond of stories. My mother likes them to be moral, and my father likes them to be merry. I shall bring a tale as my bridal pre present, he replied confidently, and before he flew away, the princess gave him a gift of a saber studded with gold. I shall exchange this for more fine clothes, he thought as he waved his princess farewell. Saturday arrived, and the princess proudly introduced her prophet to the king and queen, who invited him to tell them a story. There once was a but matches, he began. They lay on a mantelpiece between a tinder box and an old iron saucepan. They often talked about their youth. The king and queen smiled with approval. The prophet continued his tale. The matches were proud. They were once branches on a fir tree that towered above all other trees. They boasted how the trunk of the tree became a main mast of a magnificent ship that sailed around the world. And they told how the birds would relate stories of far off lands they had visited, which is why the matches felt they were above living in a kitchen. The queen who loved a moral tale, applauded when she heard this. But where's the merriment? asked the king. Soon, replied the prophet, continuing. My story is very simple, said the iron saucepan. I have been rubbed and scrubbed and boiled over and over again. We lead a quiet life here, but the newcomer, the turf basket, tells such terrible tales that the old glass jar fell down in shock and shattered into a thousand pieces. The king laughed out loud. 
When the jug told her story, continued the prophet, the plates all clattered applause, and the fire tongs began to dance. The kettle was asked to sing, but she had a cold, so could only sing when she was boiling. Before anyone else could tell their tale, the maid came in to light the fire and struck one of the matches. How it blazed up! Now, thought the other matches, everyone can see we are of the highest rank as we bring a dazzling light. The king and queen applauded loudly. You shall marry our daughter on Monday, the king declared. The night before the wedding, the whole city was illuminated, and cakes and buns and sugar plums were thrown to the people in the street. I should play my part, thought the merchant's son, so he bought some fireworks and let them off one by one as he flew into the air in his trunk. The crowd jumped and roared with delight as rockets and fountains of light filled the sky in honor of their princess marrying a prophet. Later, the merchant's son set off into the city. I saw the prophet, one of the crowd told him. He had eyes like sparkling stars and a beard like foaming water. Happy with his evening's work and excited about his marriage the next day, the merchant's son returned to the forest. But disaster faced him. One spark from a firework had ignited the trunk and it now lay in ashes. The merchant's son could never fly again and could never visit his bride. Every day the princess sat on the palace roof waiting for her prophet, and he traveled the world telling stories, but they were never as happy as the ones he told at the princess's palace. The End Tom Thumb There once was a poor farmer and his wife who loved each other dearly. But there was one thing missing from their lives. How happy I should be if I had but one child, the wife told her husband. Even if it were no bigger than my thumb, I should love it with all my heart. So when the wife heard about the great magician Merlin at the court of King Arthur, she persuaded her husband to pay him a visit. Merlin agreed to help, and months later the wife had a little boy, no bigger than his father's thumb. They named him Tom Thumb. Tom was a clever boy and always eager to help his parents. One day, as his father struggled with the cart, Tom had an idea. Let me go into the horse's ear and tell him which way to go, he suggested excitedly. So Tom gave the instructions and the horse obeyed. Watching from the road were two strangers. How odd said one, that cart is moving, and I can hear a voice, but I can't see anyone driving. The men followed the cart and soon heard Tom calling, See, Father, I did it! And to their astonishment, the old man lifted the tiny boy out of the horse's ear. The men approached, asking if they could buy Tom as they could see he would make them a fortune. At first the farmer refused, but Tom wanted the best for his parents. Take the money, father, he said. I promise I will soon come back to you. So, reluctantly, the old farmer handed Tom to the strangers for a tidy sum of money. As they set off, Tom sat perched on one of the men's hats, figuring out his plan. When they finally stopped, he wasted no time, jumping down and running straight into the first mouse hole he saw. The two men tried in vain to reach him, but the hole was too small for their hands. Furious, they were forced to give up. Tom then crept out and found an empty snail shell where he fell asleep. He was woken by whispering, There's the parson's house. Let's steal his gold and silver said one voice. But how? asked another. Sitting up, Tom could just make out two men in dark clothes. Take me with you, and I'll show you how to get into the parson's house, called Tom. The men were startled to see such a small creature. 
I can get into the house without being seen, explained Tom, and pass out all the valuables. So Tom went along with the thieves and found himself standing in the hall of the parson's house. Do you want this can candelabra? shouted Tom through the window. Keep your voice down, came the whispered reply. But Tom continued to make a noise, hoping to wake someone. It was the cook who woke first. Hearing a clatter and the sound of voices, she sprang out of bed. She failed to notice Tom in the hall, but when the thieves saw her at the door, they raced away. Pleased with his work, Tom crept outside and spent the night in the hayloft. Early the next morning, the maid picked up a bundle of hay to feed to the cows. Little did she know that she had picked up the tiny boy, too, and soon he was swallowed by a hungry cow. Tom's cries were drowned out by the loud moo from the cow as she continued to chew the hay happily. Only later, as the maid finished milking, did she hear Tom calling, I'm inside the cow! The startled maid ran to fetch the parson. It wasn't an easy task, but finally Tom was freed, and yet his adventures did not stop there. For just as Tom was crossing a field, he was spotted by a wolf lurking in the trees. Quick as a flash, the hungry wolf sprang out of the woods and pounced on poor Tom, swallowing him whole. But the clever little boy did not give up. He had a plan. My good friend, how would you like a feast? He called out. The wolf could not resist. A feast, you say, he replied eagerly, with ham, beef, cold chicken, cake, and every delight you could wish for, replied Tom, directing the wolf to his parents' house. Arriving there, the wolf headed straight for the pantry. He ate and ate and ate, and soon needed to lie down. Inside the wolf's tummy, Tom began to sing very loudly. Keep quiet, snapped the wolf. But Tom continued, and his trick worked. The farmer's wife woke and called her husband. As they peeped into the kitchen, they were horrified to see a wolf sleeping by the pantry door. As the farmer grabbed his axe, he was amazed to hear Tom calling out, Father! Father! I am inside the wolf! So the farmer struck the wolf on the head. Minutes later, to the delight of his parents, Tom Thumb was sitting on the kitchen table telling them all about his adventures. I have been down a mouse hole, slept in a snail shell, been eaten first by a cow and then a wolf, he laughed. And now you are home, cried his mother happily, and they all agreed. There was no place better than home. The End The Wolf in Sheep's Clothing there once was a wolf who lived in a forest beside a sheep farm. You might think this would mean he would never be hungry, but there was a problem. Four sheepdogs guarded the large farm, and the wolf was no match for all of them. I should be having lamb dinner every day, whined the lean, miserable wolf. His eyes narrowed hungrily, and his long red tongue drooled as he spied on the sheep from the shadows of the forest. Look how deliciously plump they are, feeding on that lush grass all day. The clever sheepdogs always made sure that one of them was awake right through the night. And if that dog so much as sniffed a wolf's scent in the air, he would bark at the top of his voice, until the farmer came running out. Stay away from my sheep, the farmer would yell as the wolf ran for dear life back into the forest. Come near my farm again and it will be the end of you. So as the sheep grew even fatter, the wolf became hungrier and hungrier. He didn't know how he was going to survive. Then one day, as he peered longingly through the trees, he noticed that the farmer was shearing the sheep. 
He watched as the thick woolly coats disappeared one by one. I'm taking these to the market, the farmer told his sheep dogs as he lifted the coats on the back of his truck. You keep an eye on that wolf for me. Any sign of him, then teach him a lesson he'll never forget. The wolf continued to watch from the safety of the trees as the farmer drove his truck out of the farm. Just as the truck was disappearing over a hill, the wolf saw one of the bundles of wool fall off the back and onto the road. With a sly grin, the wolf suddenly had a wicked idea. Using the cover of the trees and the hedges, he sneaked along the road until he reached the bundle. He quickly unrolled it and draped the thick sheep's coat over his head and back. Look at me, a poor sheep was lost his way. He practiced his new voice. I'd better go to the flock over there and see if they'll let me join them. Feeling very pleased with himself, the wolf made his way back toward the farm, being careful to keep his head near the ground. Bah, bah, he bleated as the four sheepdogs approached, wondering where he had come from. The wolf meekly told them his made-up story and then held his breath. To his delight, the sheepdogs believed him and let him pass to join their flock. The sheep also believed him, taking great pity on the wolf and welcoming him right into their center. It was just where the wolf wanted to be, well hidden from the dogs. Are you hungry? One of the sheep asked the wolf kindly. Yes, I am a little, the wolf bleated, meekly thinking how tasty the sheep looked. I haven't eaten for days. Well, there's a lot of lush grass here, the sheep said kindly. The sly wolf started to plan when to pounce. He allowed himself a little smile when one sheep told him about a wolf lurking in the forest. Don't worry, the sheep reassured him. The sheepdogs won't let him get anywhere near. His cunning plan had worked. The sheep were all fooled by his sheep's coat. All that is, except the youngest. This small, scrawny lamb kept sniffing at the wolf. She was so new to the world that she did not know what a wolf was, but she knew what a sheep was. She smells different than us, Mama. The lamb bleated. Ah, that's probably because she had a long, rough journey, Mother explained. And look, she's got claws, the lamb said, so small that she could see right underneath the wolf's false coat. And long, sharp teeth. At the mention of the teeth, the sheep all started to bleat very loudly. The deafening noise alerted the four sheepdogs, who raced toward them. The wolf immediately broke free of the flock, his wool coat sliding off as he made desperately for the trees. The dogs were right on his heels, barking fiercely. It was only when the wolf had reached his cave right in the middle of the forest that he knew he had escaped the dogs, but his body was still trembling from head to toe. As for the sheep, they vowed to be a lot more careful in the future. They would never foolishly trust a stranger again, whether he looked just like them or not. The End Little Red Riding Hood There once was a sweet and happy little girl whose granny had made her a lovely red cape with a hood. The little girl loved it so much that she wore it everywhere she went. Soon everyone became so used to her wearing it that they named her Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood, said her mother one morning, Granny is not feeling very well. Take her this basket of food and see if you can cheer her up. Little Red Riding Hood loved to visit her granny, so she took the basket of food and set off right away. Go straight to Granny's house and don't talk to any strangers, her mother called after her. Don't worry, sang Little Red Riding Hood as she went merrily on her way. 
Little Red Riding Hood skipped off through the woods. The sun was shining, the birds were chirping in the treetops, and she didn't have a care in the world. Very soon she met a wolf. Well, hello there, said the wolf in a silky low voice. And where are you off to on this fine morning? I'm going to visit my granny, replied Little Red Riding Hood, forgetting her mother's warning. She's not feeling well, and I'm taking her this food to make her better. The wolf licked his lips. Where does your dear old granny live? asked the wolf. She lives in a cottage at the other side of the woods, replied Little Red Riding Hood. It has pretty roses growing around the door. That's so, said the wolf. Why, it sounds lovely. There were some beautiful wild flowers growing in the woods, and Little Red Riding Hood stopped to admire them. Why don't you pick a pretty bunch of flowers for your granny, suggested the wolf. Little Red Riding Hood thought that was a good idea, and stooped down to pick some. As she was busy choosing the prettiest flowers, the wolf strolled away down the path. His tummy rumbled loudly. At the end of the path, he saw a cottage with roses growing around the door, just as Little Red Riding Hood had said. The wicked old wolf knocked on the door. Come right in, my darling, called the grandmother, thinking that it was Little Red Riding Hood. The wolf walked into the cottage. Before the grandmother had a chance to call for help, the wicked creature opened his huge jaws and swallowed her whole. Then he climbed into her bed, pulled the covers up under his chin, and waited. Soon, Little Red Riding Hood reached her granny's house with her basket of food and a beautiful bunch of wild flowers. Won't granny be pleased to see me, she thought as she knocked on the door. Come right in, my darling, replied a strange, croaky voice. Poor Granny, thought Little Red Riding Hood. She doesn't sound at all well. Little Red Riding Hood looked in the kitchen, but her Granny wasn't there. She looked in the sitting room, but her Granny wasn't there either. Finally, she went into her Granny's bedroom and she gasped in surprise. Granny, exclaimed Little Red Riding Hood, your ears are absolutely enormous. All the better to hear you with, my dear, replied a low, sulky voice. And your eyes are as big as saucers, gulped Little Red Riding Hood. All the better to see you with, replied a rumbling, growly voice. And your teeth are so pointed, gasped Little Red Riding Hood. All the better to eat you with, snarled a loud, hungry voice. The wicked old wolf leapt out of the bed and gobbled up Little Red Riding Hood in one big gulp. Then he lay down on the bed and fell fast asleep. Luckily, a woodcutter was working nearby and he heard some very loud and growly snoring sounds coming from the little cottage. I don't like the sound of that, he thought. With his axe at the ready, he crept into the grandmother's house. He tiptoed into the bedroom and found the wolf fast asleep, but his tummy bulging fit to burst. You wicked old wolf, cried the woodcutter. What have you done? He tipped the wolf upside down and shook him as hard as he could. Out fell a very dazed Little Red Riding Hood, followed by her poor old granny. It was so dark in there, cried the little girl. Thank you for saving us. But Little Red Riding Hood's granny was furious. She chased the wolf out of her bedroom, through the cottage, and out into the woods. The woodcutter and Little Red Riding Hood followed close behind her. The wolf never returned, and Little Red Riding Hood never spoke to strangers ever again. The End